Thank you, Brenda. I appreciate it. And uh, I did mention before, feel free if you're at the back, come on, move up. And it's nice to sort of have everybody nice and close as we talk about what is one of my favorite topics and I hope to be one of yours shortly. Uh, and that is fatigue and fatigue management in the workplace. So there's quite a bit that I want to share with you today. So I'm going to sort of jump right in and get started. I want to give you an overview of what um, I'm wanting to share forward. We're going to start off by talking about fatigue management in the workplace by looking at the issue. Why do we care about fatigue in the first place? Why are we here talking about it? We're going to look at it in terms of safety, and we're going to talk about it in terms of health. And then we're going to look at the human factors. We're going to look at the background and information that's really useful to know when we want to understand how to manage fatigue in our workplace, when we're looking to assess fatigue in our workplace. I call it Fatigue Science 101. From there, we're going to move into looking what's stopping it, why we haven't already all progressed forward into having these amazing fatigue risk management systems. We're going to look at some of the barriers that exist when we try and manage fatigue in the workplace, and we're going to look at some of the ways that you can formally assess fatigue risks in your own work environment. And finally, we're going to move into the operational best practices. We're going to look at the strategic approaches we need to use when we're looking at managing fatigue in the workplace, and we're going to look at some of the information that you can arm your workers with when you do worker fatigue management training. All right, we're going to get started by taking a driving test. So I'm going to ask everybody in the room three questions, and I'm going to compare our answers to the national average. You ready? All right, question number one. In the past year, have you driven while feeling very tired? Who's done it? Hands up. OK, well, you guys are well above the national average. <laughs> national average, 54%. OK, we're going to move it to the next level. In the past year, who here has driven while they were so sleepy they had a hard time keeping their eyes open? Who's done it? All right, yeah, you guys are still above average, I'm sad to say. National average, 32%. Okay, let's ask the big question. Who here in the past year has actually fallen asleep at the wheel? Who's done it? Okay, well, I'm happy that you're below average at this question, but I think the national average is still a pretty scary number, and that is 20%. When we think about it, that's one in five people who say they have fallen asleep at the wheel in the past year. So let me ask you this question. Which is worse, driving drunk or driving tired? So who's going to give me driving drunk? Who's going to say driving drunk, the worst we can do? OK. Who says driving tired? Driving tired is worse. Who's going to say the same? They're about the same. All right. Fair enough. When we take people who are intoxicated, and by that we're defining it at the legal limit, 0.08 blood alcohol level, and we take people who are tired, and we're defining that as 28 hours awake, so pretty severely tired. If we put them in driving simulators or driving courses, the people who are tired do worse. In fact, on a long and monotonous course, it's an average of four times worse than those that are legally intoxicated. It makes a lot of sense when we look at this. Now, this is probably the most foundational research ever done looking at fatigue in the workplace. In fact, if you've been talking about fatigue, you probably have heard this research mentioned. These researchers way back in 1997 did this study, and it's been replicated a number of times since. But let's just say, for example, that we were all part of that original study. We'd be all brought into the lab, we'd be given a nice breakfast, and then we'd be given a drink. And a little while later, we'd be given another drink and another drink. And before you think this is a really great study to be a part of, you have to know that every so often they're going to be poking you with a needle and they're going to be testing your blood alcohol level. Now, once you've had a chance to sober up, they're going to let you go home, take some rest, and then they're going to bring you back into the lab again. And this time, they're just going to feed you breakfast and keep you awake for 28 hours straight. Now, both times, they're going to give you a series of mental and physical performance tasks and just test your ability to be able to do them. And what we would find is pretty surprising. At only 17 hours awake, you would be as impaired in your ability to do a task as someone with a blood alcohol level of 0.05. At around 20, 21 hours awake, you'd be impaired, as impaired in your ability to do a task 
as someone at the legal limit with a blood alcohol level of 0.08. And at 24 hours awake, you'd be more impaired or as impaired as someone well over the legal limit with a blood alcohol level of 0.10. This has a huge implication when we think about it in our workplaces. We would never dream of allowing someone who is legally intoxicated to show up at work and operate our machinery. We wouldn't even let them in the door. But we don't have that same recognition when someone shows up for work and says, I am exhausted. We see that impairment play out when we look at things like vehicle fatalities. It's estimated that about 21% of all vehicle fatalities have fatigue as a contributing causal factor. It's only under alcohol in terms of single largest cause. We can combine that with what we know about OSHA fatalities. We know that about 30% of all workplace fatalities have ground transportation related to the incident. And if we put that information together, it means that we can infer that about 6% of all workplace fatalities likely have fatigue as a contributing causal factor. When we think about how fatigue impacts people in the workplace, we can recognize that fatigue impacts us in waves. When we first start to get tired, it impacts us in terms of our overall alertness and our emotional ability, which in the workplace translates to people who aren't paying attention to what's going on in their work environment. Maybe their coping abilities aren't as good. They might take a little bit more risky behavior because they're, they're impatient and just want to get things done. If we don't manage our fatigue at that stage, it starts to move into the next wave, which is impacting us in our mental abilities. You see people who start to forget things, who maybe have trouble you know, remembering or concentrating, or, or maybe they're not making the best decisions. And if you aren't able to manage your fatigue at that stage, it moves into the last wave, which is impacting us in terms of our physical abilities. You see people with lower reaction time. You see their gross and fine motor coordination changing. They start being clumsy. They start dropping things. And the worst of the worst, when fatigue hits its highest level of impacting us, is when it causes something called the microsleep. That two to 60 second unplanned nap, that sort of chicken head, oh, what happened, right? That happens because sleep is a basic human need. Now, you never hear about anybody dying from lack of sleep in the same way they would food or water. And that's because a part of our brains will tell us when we need sleep and they'll take over and make us take the sleep we need if we're not getting it. The problem is the part of our brain that says, I need sleep and I need it right now, is not talking to the part of our brain that says, I'm driving a vehicle and maybe it's not the best time for a nap. <coughs> When we think about how fatigue impacts workplace incidents, we see it coming in two different places. We see it occurring, first of all, in the high frequency, low severity incidents. We attribute it to a lot of other things. They weren't paying attention. They didn't follow the procedure. They didn't go through um, the process like they normally do. They had riskier behavior than we would normally see. They forgot. But we also see fatigue in workplaces in this area. We see it in that low, low frequency, high severity incident. The ones where it's typically impacting those mental and physical abilities and causing a really severe incident. Part of the work that I do at the universities has me looking at a lot of occupational research. And I just want to bring you some of the highlights of that research as it relates to fatigue in the workplace. We know that fatigue is among the top five causes of worker error when we look across the board. And worker error, as we know, contributes to a significant portion of incidents. We know that work going past 12 hours has about a 28% increased risk of incidents. 12 hours seems to be that marker, and we notice when we get into the 13, 14 and up, an increase in terms of incidents. Work going more than 50 hours a week also doubles the risk of making an incident. We see that increase in the longer work weeks. We know that a sleep-deprived employee is about three times more likely to cause a workplace accident than someone who is well-rested. And I think this last one is quite telling in terms of where we are in managing fatigue in the workplace today. And that is, fatigue is four times more likely to cause a workplace incident uh, to cause workplace impairment than drugs or alcohol. And part of that is that we manage drugs and alcohol better than we're often currently managing fatigue. 
All right, I want to switch gears for a minute and I want to take a look at the other side of health and safety and that is the health piece. And we can recognize that fatigue has an impact not just on worker safety, but on our overall health and wellness. When we think about our health and wellness, there's really three key things that we can do that will influence our own health and wellness. And we can call those the three key pillars of health. The first pillar, something that we know quite a lot about and that is nutrition. We know the types of foods we should eat, we know what kinds of foods, portion sizes. There's a lot of information out there in terms of nutrition. And the second key pillar, exercise. And again, we know a lot about exercise. We know the types of exercises we should be doing. We can't go on the internet without finding a new exercise program that we could follow. But the third key pillar, the third thing that we can do that has a big influence on our overall health and wellness is sleep. And we tend to not have the same information available to us about sleep. We know that sleep is important in a lot of the systems that it impacts. We recognize it will impact things like our cardiovascular health. People who are regularly sleep deprived have about a 40% increase in risk in terms of cardiovascular disease. Fatigue also impacts our blood sugars. In fact, going only a few nights with irregular sleep will, have you, will leave you with very irregular blood sugar levels. Those blood sugar levels will leave you think, uh, sometimes feeling shaky, maybe having that brain fog, and they can have an impact on our health. So those that aren't getting enough sleep have an increased risk in type 2 diabetes. Fatigue also impacts our mental health. Shift workers and other populations that are regularly sleep deprived have an increased risk of depression and bipolar disorder. All right, true or false, fatigue makes you fat. What do you think? Who's going to give me true? True-ish. True-ish, yeah, false. Not our only factor. <laughs> Absolutely. But there's a lot of research in how not getting enough sleep can contribute to weight gain. Part of it comes back to this. Those irregular blood sugars will change how we're able to metabolize the food that we are eating. But there's more. We know that sleep is really important in terms of regulating our appetite hormones. If we aren't getting enough sleep, you're gonna be extra hungry. And not only are you extra hungry, you're gonna want larger portions and you're gonna crave higher calorie foods. And researchers think this has to do with the fact that our body is feeling really low energy because it didn't get enough sleep and it's not have, it doesn't have the energy it needs, so it's trying to make up that energy through our food. Whatever the reason, we know that when we look at populations that are regularly sleep deprived, women are on average 18 to 22 pounds heavier, men are on average 20 to 25 pounds heavier. When we look at the research, we see that sleep has an impact on a lot of our, our different health concerns. Increase, about a 15% increased risk of stroke, increased hypertension or blood pressure, increase in multiple types of cancer. In fact, the International Agency for Research on Cancer lists fatigue when it comes from sleeping outside of our regular daytime hours as a type 2A carcinogen which makes it a probable cause of cancer. It's been linked to certain cancers like breast cancer and colon cancer. We know that fatigue impacts memory and concentration. It gives that sort of permanent brain fog when we're tired, and it impacts our gastrointestinal system. We'll see things like increase in peptic ulcers. All of those things, those safety impacts and those health impacts, have an influence on our business, and they have an influence on the companies that we're working for. They influence things like productivity, employee morale, and employee retention. We see decreases in business reputation or profitability. We also see an increase in things like number and severity of incidents, in increased decision-making errors in the workplace, health issues and the insurance that's associated with that, as well as increased absenteeism and increased operational costs. All right. We recognize that fatigue is having an impact. It's impacting us in terms of health. It's impacting us in terms of safety. So now I want to empower you. I want to arm you with the knowledge that you need to be able to understand fatigue in your workplace and to be able to better manage it in your workplace. I call this information Sleep Science 101. So 
The first thing that's good to know is the amazing thing that our brain does when we sleep. This is brand new research. This research has only been out for about a year and a half to two years. And this research answers the question of why we sleep in the first place. And the amazing thing that our brain does when we sleep, whoops, <coughs> housekeeping. So let me explain. What you're seeing is an image of the human lymphatic system. Now our lymphatic system does a number of things, but one of the things it does is it takes out a lot of the toxins in our cells and it replenishes our cells. But when we look at our brain, what do you see? <laughs> what researchers, I didn't hear it. <laughs> what researchers have discovered is that when we sleep, our brains flood with something called cerebral spinal fluid. And that cerebral spinal fluid is what we believe now clears out those toxins in our brains and helps to replenish our brain cells. It's the reason when we look at an MRI scan of a brain from someone who is sleep deprived versus someone who's well rested, we can see the difference in terms of how that person's being impacted. <coughs> Another really important bit of background information that helps you understand and manage sleep is something called sleep stages. Now this research was discovered way back in the 1960s where scientists took electroencephalographs and they hooked those, those uh, uh, up to people's brains and they measured the brain waves that we naturally give off. And they used that to try and figure out what it is we do when we sleep. They discovered we go through five very distinct stages when we sleep. Stage one and two are those light stages of sleep. If you get woken up from a stage one or two sleep, you're gonna be wide awake, you're gonna be alert, you might not even be 100% sure you've been asleep. Stage one and two are important in that they restore our alertness and they restore some of our mental abilities. Now from that stage one and two, we move into the deeper stages of sleep. Stage three or four, or even sometimes we're starting to combine those and just call it stage three. You get woken up from those deeper stages of sleep you're going to feel awful. You're gonna have that sort of groggy, disoriented, achy, awful feeling that you get when you get woken up from a really deep sleep. And we know that this is the stage of sleep when your brain is being flooded by that cerebral spinal fluid and those toxins are being cleared from your brain. Now the fifth stage of sleep is one that most people have heard of, and that's our REM, our rapid eye movement, our dream sleep. And we know that dream sleep is really important in terms of processing the information that we've learned throughout the day and creating a lot of our long-term memories. Now we move through those five stages of sleep in a complete sleep cycle. And that sleep cycle takes between 90 to 120 minutes. The reason that information is important is that if we get interrupted at any point along the way while we're sleeping, <laughs> We don't get to jump back exactly where we started. We have to go all the way back to stage one and start again. What this research shows us is that it's not just sleep quantity that's important in terms of how our bodies are restored by our sleep. It has a lot to do with sleep quality. And the final bit of background information I wanna share with you so that we're ready to sort of move into the next stages is something called circadian rhythms. Now, how many people have heard of circadian rhythms? Good, more and more this information is being known. So circadian rhythms are any of our body system that work on a 24 hour cycle. And that 24 hour cycle is regulated by the light that we take in from our eyes. And if you're nerdy like me and you like this information, it's regulated by a little tiny part of our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, those light cues regulate a large number of our body systems. They regulate our body temperature, our blood pressure, our heart rate, our blood sugars, our digestive enzymes, and a lot of the hormones that we produce. And all of those body systems, in turn, have an impact on us. Our circadian rhythms will impact things like our alertness and our behavior our emotional stability, our memory and our learning abilities. They'll impact our physical coordination, our reaction time, and our decision-making skills. Now our circadians run in a pretty set cycle. So what you're looking at is an average person's circadian rhythm. So if you're a morning person, 
you're going to be a little bit more to the early side of that. And if you're a night owl, you're going to be a little bit more to the late hours. But this is a normal person. What this means is that sometime around 7 a.m. until about 10 o'clock at night, all of your body systems, all of your biology is functioning to have you be alert and awake and aware of what's going on in your environment. You will notice a little dip that occurs between 1 to 3 in the afternoon, right about now. <laughs> How many people notice the dip that occurs between 1 to 3 in the afternoon? Absolutely, we feel it, we can tell, we get up, we get a cup of coffee. But aside from that little tip, dip, this is when our biology is having us be at our best. Sometime around 10 o'clock at night until about 6 o'clock in the morning, all of that changes. And our biology is focused on having us be less aware of what's going on in our environment, less alert, less capable. Putting that all together, it means that if you're trying to do work at 2 o'clock in the morning, your heart rate is going to be a little bit lower and your blood pressure is going to be a little bit lower. If you try and eat food, your digestive enzymes aren't going to be working as well and you're going to notice that your blood sugar levels are likely to be really irregular you're actually going to have neurochemicals that are going to be working in your brain to slow down how fast your neurotransmitters can transmit information. It's not to say that we can't do work at 2 o'clock in the morning. We know that we can. But it's recognizing that when we're asking people to do that, we're working against our basic biology, and we need to build safety systems in place to account for that. When we think about our circadian rhythms, we're really trying to optimize our operational requirements with what we know about human biology and trying to find the scheduling that best matches the two. We can even think about it in terms of the schedules that exist. For example, when you think about the work that's being done in your company, can you think about times between 1 to 3 in the afternoon or 2 to 5 in the morning that you have some of your more highly safety sensitive tasks being planned? If you do, do you have to? And if you have to, do you have systems in place to account for that? All right, now that we are all fatigue experts and we know what we need to know, we're gonna move into the next stage. <clears throat> and that is thinking about the barriers that exist when we try and manage fatigue in our work environment. We're also going to spend some time and look at the formal way that we can assess fatigue risks in our work. We'll start off by looking at the barriers. When we think of the, about the barriers that exist and we try and manage fatigue, is the first one is a lack of awareness. Fatigue is part of our society. We accept it. In fact, if you're not tired, you're probably not working hard enough, right? It's how we think. And so we don't see it as a health or a safety hazard. There's nothing wrong. We're just tired. We're used to that. Everybody's tired. When we do recognize it as an issue, we're not always aware of the many strategies that exist to be able to manage it, both within our companies and within ourselves. There's also a lot of misconceptions that exist when we think about managing fatigue. It's part of our work culture. We reward it. We give extra incentive for working overtime, for working the night shifts, for being on call. There's also that false belief that we can just overcome our own biology, right? That Superman syndrome. I only need five hours. It's all I need. I swear by it. And there's that belief that we can't manage fatigue in our company because it's due to what people are doing when they're not at work. Off-duty factors, we have no controls. And finally, there's a real lack of information when it comes to managing fatigue. There is a minimal amount of fatigue education and training that exists. We have people who are working high risk when it comes to fatigue. They're working 24-hour shifts, long hours, long work weeks. We're not arming them with the tools that they need to be able to manage those risks. We also have minimal um, formal fatigue risk assessments in our work environments. We're not formally assessing this risk in the same way that we assess other risks and hazards that exist in our work environment, and then designing the controls to match those risks. And finally, 
a lot of organizations don't have fatigue embedded in their incident investigation processes. Who here would, if you happen to know, who here would say you have fatigue in your incident investigation processes? You can either identify or rule it out. Okay, who here knows they don't? In your incident, you're not taking a look at fatigue factors. It's not that difficult to embed those processes and questions to be able to recognize if fatigue was part of that incident or not. And if we're not collecting that information, we don't know when it's having an impact. And we can't talk about barriers without talking about that. How many people drive by that guy on a construction site and go, wow, that's awesome. Look at him manage his risk of fatigue. <laughs> Not our first reaction. We think lazy. We think he's goofing off. I've had people say to me when I'm out working on sites, I'm not going to pay somebody to goof off and sleep. We have that perception as of sleeping as lazy. And it's a big barrier that you have to overcome when you're looking at managing fatigue. Okay, we talked a little bit about assessing fatigue. And one of the ways we can manage fatigue in our work environment is to assess the hazards that it brings in the same way that we assess other hazards in our work environment. When we think about assessing fatigue though, we need to think about the different areas that it impacts. So one of the first areas we look at when we're assessing fatigue as a hazard is scheduling. And again, recognizing when that scheduling is starting to cause higher levels of fatigue and optimizing that scheduling as much as we can based on what we know. But we move past the scheduling. We start to look at tasks that people are doing in our work environment. Intuitively, we think about the physically demanding or the mentally demanding tasks. We recognize that those are causing fatigue in our work environment. But the tasks that tend to bring on the most fatigue the ones that make us most drowsy are boring and monotonous tasks. And when we combine those boring and monotonous tasks with something that's safety sensitive, we have to be aware of how much it impacts fatigue. And the most common time we combine those two are driving. So whenever we assess fatigue in a work environment, we think about driving because we know driving is very much impacted by fatigue. We also look at work environment. Things like temperature extremes, extreme heat, extreme cold, all of those increase our likelihood of having fatigue, as well as things like noise and vibration and chaos and stress. And we look at the worker factors. We think about things like our worker demographic. Do we have older workers that are working shift work or long hours? Recognizing that increases the likelihood. What about the people in, in your workforce? Do they have long commutes? Do they have social obligations? Are they, for example, involved in agriculture, which also increases the, the risk of fatigue if they're farming certain times of the year? We can formally assess those risks. So I had a uh, one-day seminar on the Sunday talking about this issue, and one of the things we did as part of that workshop was we formally assessed those fatigue risks. And when we quantify those fatigue risks, it lets us um, prioritize the controls that we bring in and recognize what's causing the highest risk with regards to fatigue. And we recognized both those high frequency, low severity incidents that fatigue would cause, as well as those low severity, uh, pardon me, low frequency, high severity incidents. All right, we're moving into the top of the hour, both sort of figuratively and literally. I want to now share with you some of the operational best practices that you can use when you look at managing fatigue. We'll start off by thinking about the strategic approaches that we can use when we uh, want to manage fatigue within our companies. And then we're going to share forward some of the worker information, some of the things that we can do when we're managing fatigue at, say, a conference, and we've got lots of it going on, or that we can give to our workers to help them to manage fatigue in their work lives. When we think about managing fatigue in our organizations, we have to recognize that as much as fatigue is somewhat similar to other hazards in our work environment, it's also somewhat <coughs> unique. And it's unique in the fact that some of the risk factor can be brought in outside of what occurs within our company. So unlike things like fall protection or confined space, 
you can have a worker that shows up first thing in the morning already fatigued. They're already fatigued because they have a sleep disorder or a health issue or the baby was up all night or they had to commute two and a half hours or whatever else is going on. But all of the risk doesn't occur just within the work that's defined. And so because of that, because fatigue is a little bit more complex, we have to take a two-tiered approach to be able to manage it. So this model, I call it the eye of fatigue, is one way of demonstrating that two-tiered approach that we need to take when we manage fatigue. First, you need to have all-encompassing organizational strategies. You need to have those policies and procedures. You need to do some formal risk assessment and management. But more than that, you need to have that worker engagement piece. You need to have the education and awareness and those open discussions that allow you to be able to engage your workforce to help manage this issue. At the end of the day, to successfully manage fatigue, you need to have a culture that says workers and managers are coming together to manage the hazards and the risks. If you do that, if you can bring in that twofold process, then you start to see some of the cost benefits that come about from better managing fatigue, and you can use that business case to justify some of the strategies you're bringing into play. So, that's our 30,000 foot look at how to manage fatigue. Let's drill down a little deeper and look at what that looks like in terms of practice. When we think about managing fatigue and bringing in a fatigue risk management strategy, there's really a five stage process that we can use. First stage is looking at your data, your data assessment, your diagnostic. What does that look like? Well, it looks like formally assessing some of the risks that we talked about earlier, but it also looks like looking at some of the other metrics that exist. Thinking about your overtime and thinking about uh, when your incidents are occurring, time of day of incidents if you're not already tracking them. Looking at uh, a lot of the other information in your environment that will inform you in terms of how fatigue is having an impact. Then we need to think about senior leadership engagement. You've got to have senior leadership on board if you're going to bring about a fatigue risk management strategy. Some of that is sharing forward the information in terms of how fatigue impacts people and increases the risk. Some of that is talking about the business values that can be impacted in terms of health and in terms of safety. At the end of the day, we're talking about your risk management and aligning the discussions on fatigue with your other discussions in terms of risk management. Once you have that information in hand and you've got the support, you can move into your fatigue strategy development. It's not that different than some of the other ways that we manage risk. It's using our hierarchy of controls in order to manage the risks that we see. It looks something like this. So you've got your, your risk that you identify, you can rate it, you can look at your controls, you can think about your implementation strategies. When you're working on your implementation strategy, when you're looking at bringing in that, those uh, strategies that you've developed, first and foremost, education and training. And that needs to go across the board. Your senior leadership should be aware of some of the things about the risk of fatigue and how it's impacting business values. Your managers and supervisors need to be aware of what it looks like. When is someone being impaired by fatigue? When do we need to intervene? And your workers need to be given that toolbox of strategies that they can use to better manage that risk when they're at work. You might want to look at things like a steering committee that can help you if you're bringing in big changes or maybe aligning with a committee that already exists. And whatever you do, don't make your fatigue risk management strategy an outlier. Don't have it different than the other safety systems that you already have in place. Align it to your systems that already exist and have it work together. That's going to create your, your sustainability when you're bringing in your strategies. Speaking of sustainability, don't forget your post-implementation. Think back to what we know. Plan, do, check, act. Make sure that fatigue is integrated into your incident investigations and your audit processes so that you can recognize if what you've brought into play is working. All of that together will create the fatigue risk management strategies that your companies need to either bring in or enhance to move forward. All right, 
for the rest of our time together, I want to share with you some of the information that you can give to people in your organizations to help them in terms of managing fatigue. And there might be a strategy here that uh, you might want to use as we go through the fatigue of the conference. Starting off, when we're thinking in a workplace setting, you need to empower your managers or supervisors to recognize it when they see it. What does fatigue look like in a workplace? Well, you see people all of a sudden, you're not thinking very clearly. Maybe they have to look up information a little bit more than they normally would. They've got low energy, they're kind of subdued, nobody's you know, working the way they normally do, or they're double checking things a lot. You might see people who are having trouble making a decision all of a sudden, or who are engaging a little bit riskier behavior than they normally would. You might, at this extreme level, start to see people who are clumsy, who are dropping things, who are tripping, who are making those kinds of mistakes. When we give people the strategies to be able to manage fatigue, we can give them two different types of strategies. We can give them those preventative strategies, those things that they can do to help reduce the likelihood of fatigue becoming an issue in the first place, and we can give them what I call when duty calls, the critical management strategies. We'll start off by looking at the preventative strategies. So all of the things that we can do to make ourselves more resilient, less likely to become fatigued in the first place. All right, here comes a tricky one. True or false? The only way to cure fatigue is through sleep. I'm warning you, I'm being tricky. Who says true? Oh, nobody's going, I'm not saying nothing, I'm not coming to this one. <laughs> All right, no takers. Okay, who says false? All right, I did warn you, I was being tricky. It is true. In that, in the long run, only sleep cures fatigue. And it's an important thing to keep in mind when we're talking about managing fatigue. Everything else we do is a band-aid solution that gets us to our next time of full rest. What happens to most of us is not that we're staying up 24, 36 hours straight. What happens to most of us is that we're busy and we're working and life is happening and we have all of those other things that are going on. Kids have to get where they need to go. and we don't get as much sleep as we should have got on Monday. And then life is busy again and we're traveling and whatever is happening and we don't get as much sleep as we needed on Tuesday. And the same thing happens on Wednesday and Thursday until by Friday we are sitting at an eight hour sleep debt. And an eight hour sleep debt will impair you in the same way as having missed an entire night's sleep. We also can build up our sleep debt based on our age. What happens when we age, and this is important when we think about an aging workforce, is not that we need less sleep. We need the same amount of sleep, but we can't get that sleep in one full setting in the way that we used to be able to. Our sleep stages and sleep cycles start to change as we age. So having people know this and having them be aware of this can help them in terms of better managing their sleep and their fatigue. We can also teach workers about something called Zeitgebers. And Zeitgebers is just a fun word. I actually like to say that, Zeitgebers. Zeitgebers are really any of the systems that we use to train our brain to recognize when it's time to be awake and time to sleep. It's really useful for shift workers because we can teach them some of the cues that they give their bodies that tell them when it's time to shift. Things like light cues, or when they're uh, having social interactions, or working out, or when to eat. And when to eat on shift work can really help in terms of managing some of the issues. Teach people about sleep hygiene, some of the basics. This is really useful information if any of your workers are traveling, if they're on campsite, or if you've got shift workers. Teaching the importance of sleep hygiene to improve our overall sleep. And of course, we talk about sleep disorders. Sleep disorders are remarkably common, up to 15% of the population. In fact, that rate goes up when we talk about men over the age of 45 who are at higher risk for some sleep disorders, for example, sleep apnea. How many here have heard of sleep apnea? Yeah, more and more this sleep disorder is gaining attention and I think that's a good thing because it is one of those sleep disorders that you may not recognize you have. If you have insomnia, 
you're pretty aware that you have insomnia. But if you have sleep apnea, you may or may not know. We recognize someone who has uh, obstructive sleep apnea if you listen to them sleep. So someone with sleep apnea is going to do that. Snore, snore, snore. Stop breathing. Absolutely. And then they do that <gasps> big gasp and wake, you know, wake up a little bit enough to start breathing again and start that process over and over and over again. So we talk about sleep disorders and we share some of that information and we can encourage things such as having treatment, having screening, um, and talking about the compliance and the importance of that. All right, let's talk about that critical management. What we need to do to manage fatigue when we're tired and the work still needs to be done. One of the things that's important to recognize when we think about sleep in a work environment is there's really two things that will impact it. The first is our internal factors. Things like being up at night when we're not used to it, having, not having en had enough sleep during our circadians, um, some of the medications we take, all of those things will impact our internal <coughs> likelihood of being tired. But there's also task-related factors. And task-related factors come from the work that's being conducted. So it might be the time on task, how long we've been doing it, the task complexity, is it mentally or physically fatiguing, and that task monotony. That task factor can bring on feelings of drowsiness even if you didn't previously have internal factors of fatigue. Both of those impact our ability to be alert, to pay attention, and they'll impact our performance or our driving performance depending on what we're doing. If we can't manage our sleep at that moment in time, if we can't go home and have a full night's sleep, next best strategy, the nap. So let me ask you this question. Do you nap? All right, who does it? At least twice a week, has a good nap, manages sleep debt with a nap. All right, that's awesome. Who here doesn't do it, can't nap, I hate it, it never works for me, all right. I hope I can help you out. Um, first question, do you need a nap? If you don't have a sleep debt, if you're always feeling awake and alert, you don't need one. But if you are feeling tired and sleepy and you do find fatigue is impacting you, sleeping longer on your days off, or worse of worse, falling asleep when you're in that nice comfortable place, you should be using naps as a strategy to help you manage your fatigue. Some of the best information we know about napping comes from NASA. NASA did studies where they looked at pilots who took naps in flight. And they found that when pilots took that 26 minute NASA nap, they had about a 34% increase in terms of performance, they had a 54% increase in terms of alertness, and they were able to make better decisions. So the secret to napping, ready for it? Timing is everything. So, if you want to take a nap, you want to keep your nap under 30 minutes. In fact, often we say around 10 to 25 minutes is your optimal time for a nap. Why? Goes back to what we know about sleep cycles and sleep stages. Under 25 minutes, you're only going into that stage one and two sleep. You're going to wake up, you're going to be wide awake, and you'll have improved your overall alertness and mental abilities. If you have a big sleep debt, if you're super tired, now you want to go to that 90 minute to 120 minute nap. Why? Well, now we've gone through the entire sleep cycle, all the way through, ended up back at that stage one and two. You're going to be wide awake, you're going to be alert, you're going to be ready to go. The what you don't want to do, sort of the never, never in the napping world. You don't want to try and sleep between 45 minutes and just over an hour, and then have someone come wake you up or set an alarm because chances are you're gonna wake up right in the middle of that stage three sleep and you're gonna feel awful. The other way that timing is really important in terms of our napping, we wanna nap in the circadian low. So sometime between one to three in the afternoon, perfect time for a nap. I see that guy in the back, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, if you're working nights, you can pretty much nap anytime, but the optimal time for a nap, two to five in the morning. 
A short nap, even 10 minutes, can easily make up for an hour or more of sleep debt. In fact, the research hasn't fully quantified it, but I find it easily helps with two or even three hours of sleep debt. And anybody who's managing a sleep debt should have a strategy, a strategy to be able to manage the naps. Ideally, that strategy involves a rest area in the work environment if you have people working 24 hours long shifts. It's a hard sell. In some industries, it's accepted it's all good. In some, there is just absolutely no way we're going to have people sleeping on the job. It's the best case scenario. If you don't have a rest area and you can't bring in a rest area into those higher risk environments, you can still have nap strategies. You can still talk to people about the importance of napping pre-shift, or if you've got shift workers driving home at the end, the importance of really assessing fatigue before you get in the car and do the commute home. <coughs> when we look at the task-related fatigue, when we look at the other side of that equation, there's a whole variety of strategies that we can teach people. I'll share just a few. Um, if you've got people working in crews or team environments, you can have them come together and manage those tasks as a group. Even individually, we can talk about things like taking a break, um, the importance of finding a partner if you can, someone to talk to you, keep you more awake. Uh, I used this when I was working with a group who, um, they were in the nuclear industry and they had a really highly safety sensitive task that was occurring between three and four in the morning. Well, your first question is why? Why is that scheduled at three to four in the morning? One of the worst times to do it. But what they had for the short-term coping strategy while we were working on uh, changing the way things were scheduled was to call in a partner. And when you had to do that work, have someone with you and talk you through it, keep you more alert, more awake. <coughs> tell a colleague, tell a supervisor. If you've got that open culture where you can manage fatigue, it's a good strategy or having someone change to a less safety sensitive task. And sometimes this involves a bit of cross training to be able to do that. Could not talk about managing fatigue if we didn't talk about coffee, absolutely. Okay, I've got about a one and a half minute video clip I wanna share that shares the magic of coffee. With its stimulating effects, it's easy to understand why coffee is the second most traded commodity on Earth after oil. For many, it keeps us awake and moving through our busy days. But how does it work? What exactly does coffee do to your brain? Whenever you're awake, a chemical called adenosine slowly accumulates in your brain. And this adenosine binds to receptors which slow down brain activity. Ultimately, the more adenosine there is, the more tired your brain feels. Which makes sense, as the longer you're awake, the more fatigued you become. Conversely, while you sleep, the concentration of adenosine declines, gradually promoting wakefulness. But it turns out that the caffeine in your coffee is incredibly similar to adenosine in structure. The caffeine works its way through your bloodstream and into your brain, where it starts to compete and binds with adenosine receptors. But because it's not adenosine, the sleepiness effect isn't felt. Adenosine can no longer bind, meaning its calming properties are diminished, which is great for you when you're feeling tired. However, with long-term use of caffeine, your brain responds by creating more adenosine receptors, which means more caffeine is required to elicit the same response. It also means that when you try to quit drinking coffee or miss your daily intake, you might experience some withdrawal symptoms and feel more tired than you would have before you ever drank coffee. But the caffeine doesn't stop there. It also stimulates the production of adrenaline, you know, the fight or flight hormone. This increases your heart rate, gets your blood pumping, and even opens up your airways. Furthermore, it affects dopamine levels by preventing its reabsorption in the brain, which makes you feel happy. In fact, this is the exact same thing that cocaine does, just to a lesser degree. It's a drug after all. This dopamine stimulation is also the aspect of coffee that makes it moderately addictive. Never heard your coffee compared to cocaine before, have you? <laughs> oh, you have. All right. Um, also, when we talk about fatigue in a work environment, we can talk about strategic use of caffeine. We can talk about the different ways that people get their caffeine. Caffeine. We talk about the pros and cons. You can talk about the timing of caffeine. It's about 20 minutes to get into your system. It's got a half-life of about five hours. Another really interesting technique that we can teach people in terms of managing our fatigue is food. So we know now that irregular sleep and lack of sleep has our blood sugars being really irregular. Well, there's something called glycemic index. Now, anybody who knows anyone who's a diabetic is pretty aware about glycemic index. 
glycemic index is the way that the food affects our blood sugar levels. So foods with a high glycemic index, they're going to shoot our blood sugar levels up quickly and then they're going to drop them quickly. Foods with a low glycemic index are going to bring your blood sugar levels up slowly, keep them pretty even, and then drop them slowly. You want to, for the most part, choose foods with low glycemic index. The good news? Foods with low glycemic index are healthier foods anyways. Whole foods, fruit, uh, whole fruits and vegetables, uh, dairy products, low fat proteins, nuts, all of those things keep our blood sugar levels pretty regular. The bad news, when you're tired, you are going to crave the donut. So it's the reason anybody ever gone into a, a place that has shift work, what's sitting on the table? Guaranteed. Absolutely. Why? Because everybody's craving the sugars and their hunger's going up and their hunger's coming down. So what we talk about when we do worker presentations and what you want to share forward is that if you can't deny the donut, if you absolutely have to take that donut, well at least pair it with a low glycemic index food so that you can stop that up and down cycle of your blood sugars throughout the night. This helps to impact how fatigue makes you feel and it also can help offset some of the health issues. The one you want to be aware of, yeah, looks great, doesn't it? That super high fat meal. And it's not that we can never have a big juicy burger and fries, but it's recognizing that when we need to do something safety sensitive, this is about the worst thing we could do. Now this has a big impact on me. I travel a huge amount for the work that I do. And often I'm on the highways and I'm driving late at night and guess what food I can find just about anywhere. And recognizing that if you eat that really high fatty meal when you need to be alert and you need to be awake, a lot of your body energy is going to go to digesting that food. It's going to leave you feeling sleepy. At the end of the day, the way that fatigue most impacts us in terms of safety is driving. So we talk a lot about the importance of, of, of managing the risks when we are driving. If at all possible, eliminate fatigue. Take a nap, be well rested before you drive. If you can't eliminate it, at least reduce it. Pull over, get out of the car, move around. If you hit this stage where you're just temporarily holding it off, you're stimulating your environment, you're turning up the air, you're turning up the music, you're trying to shift around, yeah, we've done it, we know it. It's really temporary. And recognize that your risk is going really high when you hit that stage. I want to share with you probably the best technique I ever heard when it comes to training people in this. I was working in a pretty remote area and I had someone who said, hey, I got it. I have the best strategy. I use it every time. It never fails me. I'm like, oh, hey, do tell. I always want to hear a new fatigue strategy. The guy says, well, I just take my hair. Now you have to have the visual here. The guy had this massive comb over going on and he proceeds to demonstrate. He's gathering up the big comb over showing me. He says, I unroll my window just a little bit, put it in, roll it up, and when I go to sleep, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Best strategy ever, not one I'm recommending. When you get to this stage, be aware your risk is really going up. Nobody wants to end up like this guy. All right, I want to share with you what is probably my favorite fatigue technique. Up to 300 people are killed every year in accidents where the driver has fallen asleep at the wheel. Before you feel too tired, Pull off the road into a services or other safe area. Drink some strong coffee and take a quick nap while the caffeine kicks in. If you haven't a nap, you've left your lights on, sir. All right, cheers. Think, don't drive tired. Call that technique the nappuccino. <laughs> Drink some strong caffeine while you're waiting that 20 minutes for it to kick in. Take your nap. You wake up, wide awake from the nap, caffeine's kicking in, boy, we are good to go. All right, as we finish up, I wanna share with you a little bit of research I did a couple of years ago. 
I did this for a client who was looking at bringing in some fatigue, uh, fatigue risk management strategies, but they wanted the industry benchmarking. They wanted to know what other people in their industry were doing. So I called up a large number of oil and gas service companies and did some of that benchmarking research. And I asked them all kinds of questions. You know, what are your biggest risk factors? What are your operational best practices? What do you have in place of training? We did lots of information. But I think this is probably the most significant. I said, do you have fatigue integrated into your incident investigation processes? Can you identify or rule it out? Only about a third said yes. But then I asked the question, can you identify a major incident that involved fatigue that occurred within the last three years? 82% said yes. Even without the formal processes, they could recognize it. I also want to share with you the moment in time where I became most passionate about the work that I do. I was in a really remote mining uh, area and I was doing a formal fatigue risk assessment on all of the different areas of the mine. So we were formally assessing the underground and the open pit and the processing and so on. And this was the open pit mine. It had every risk factor you can think of. It had 24-hour operations. It had extreme temperatures. It was circumpolar. They had those short, short winter days. Uh, we had haul truck drivers going around and around an open pit, so you can imagine the monotonous work that they were doing. We had heavy and light duty equipment going up and down the same service road. But aside from the fact that their risk factors were super high, there were no incidents that we could identify as being fatigue related. So at first I was a little bit confused. I'm like, how is this going on? So I did some poking around and asking. And the manager who worked in that area of the mine had had his own incident a few years before. And he talked about fatigue. And he gathered that information and he brought it into the safety meetings. And even though there was no formal process at all in any of the areas of the mine, including this one, there was the unspoken rule that if you were tired and you were driving, you radioed in that you were taking your 30 minute break, you pulled over, you took a nap. Not only was it accepted, it was encouraged. And I think the ability to have those management systems in place was what allowed them to have incredibly high risk factors and no incidents that we could see. Okay, I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions. Okay, so um, we do have a few minutes for questions if anybody has any that they'd like to ask. Yeah. You had a statistic early on that was 26 to 28 percent increase over 12 hours. Yes. And you used to read about things, you know, they quoted more like over eight hours when people started losing their ability. Can you speak towards that a little bit? Yeah, so it's not eight hours awake. Um, and it's not necessarily an eight-hour shift. It's that over 12-hour shifts, which when we factor in the likelihood of how long people have been awake, it's just when statistically we start to see the increase in incidence. So eight-hour shifts from eight to 10, there's not really a large increase. Okay. Um, I am gonna be here if anyone has questions after the facts. Um, I also have um, uh, a brochure of information that's a little bit of what we've been looking at today. Uh, it's available through the app, and I also have a couple of hard copies up here and some business cards if anybody's interested. So, thank you. Thank you.